The Dyatlov Mystery Today, on Echoes Through Time Channel, we will explore the enigmatic Dyatlov Pass incident, one of the most fascinating mysteries of recent history. This puzzling event took place in the Ural Mountains, in the Soviet Union, in 1959, and remains unsolved to this day. In January of that year, a group of 10 skiing enthusiasts, mostly students and graduates from the Ural Polytechnic Institute, gathered to embark on a training route. Their goal was to prepare for even more demanding future challenges. However, the route they chose already presented a significant challenge. Due to the time of year and the extreme weather conditions, this journey was categorized as Level 3, the most difficult. The expedition leader was Igor Dyatlov, a 23-year-old radio engineering student who organized and led the group. Alongside him were Yuri Doroshenko, 21, also a radio engineering student known for his bravery and determination, Ludmila Dubanina, 20, a construction engineering student passionate about singing and photography, known among her peers for her strong character, Yuri Yudin, 21, an economic student and close friend of Dyatlov, Nikolai Thabo Brignol, 23, a construction engineering student of Franco-Russian descent with a particular interest in mechanics and physics. Alexander Kolevidov, 24, a physics and geotechnic student who enjoyed reading and music and had an interest in mineralogy. Rustam Slobodin, 23, a mechanical engineering graduate, a talented athlete and amateur musician known for his physical endurance. Yuri Kravaniskenko, 23, a construction engineering graduate working at the Chelyabinsk, 40 nuclear plant, and a fan of music and comedy. Zinaida Kalmagorova, 22, a construction engineering student who enjoyed hiking and sports, known for her courage and enthusiasm, and, finally, Semyon Zolotaryov, 38, a skiing instructor and war veteran who joined the group at the last moment, bringing his experience in survival techniques and military training. On January 25, 1959, the group arrived by train in Ivdol, accompanied by a local guide they hired for the expedition named Semyon Zolotaryov. Some members of the group were not very fond of Zolotaryov's presence, as he was much older than them. However, photos that have survived suggest that over time, a good relationship developed among all group members. Zolotaryov had initially planned to guide a larger group on a longer route, but eventually decided to join the students on their shorter route, intending to have a few days off to take his mother on vacation. Little did he know then how tragic this decision would be for him. The group, thanks to the offer of a truck driver, headed to Vizai, the northernmost inhabited settlement. From this place, Igor Dyatlov, as the group leader, sent a telegram to his university, saying, We arrived safely, already on the route. He also sent a postcard to his father that read, Hello everyone. Today the 26th we set out on the route, we arrived safely. From February 12th to 15th, I will visit Sverdlovsk. I probably won't come home, so let Rufa bring bedding to our room for a trip to Penza. From there, I'll return from March 5th to 7th. Greetings, Igor. On January 27th, 1959, they began their trek towards Otorten, a mountain 10 kilometers north of the incident site. The next day, January 28th, Yuri Yudin had to return home due to a back injury. A member of the Monsi tribe accompanied him on his return, at that moment, leaving the expedition might have seemed like the worst luck, not knowing that this setback would save him from a gruesome death. On February 1, 1959, the group set up camp on the eastern slope of Kolitsayakal, known in Monsi as the Mountain of the Dead. During their journey, the weather was extremely harsh, with temperatures dropping below minus 30 degrees Celsius. Additionally, strong winds and snowstorms further complicated conditions, making the wind chill even lower.
Due to these extreme weather factors and poor visibility, they deviated from the route towards the top of the mountain. Realizing their mistake, they decided to stop and set up a temporary camp, hoping for better weather conditions. What they didn't know at the time was that this would be their final resting place. On February 12, 1959, Dyatlov had promised to send a telegram to his university's sports club to keep them informed and at ease. Initially, the delay in receiving news was attributed to possible bad weather and a delay in the expedition. However, after not receiving any news in the following days, on February 20th, family and friends organized a search. A telegram sent by the sister of one of the hikers to another relative reached the Kremlin, prompting government intervention. On the 23rd, Soviet police and military, equipped with helicopters and planes, began the search. They headed to the mountain where the expedition was supposed to be camped according to their route chronology. However, they found no one or anything indicating they had reached that place. On the 25th, rescuers discovered what appeared to be the remains of a tent on the mountain slope. Upon approaching, they observed that the tent was torn and destroyed, with all the group's belongings inside. The strange thing was not only that the tent was torn, but that it had been cut from the inside out, indicating that the group must have experienced an extreme situation inside to not open it normally and rush out. Among the belongings, they found diaries and cameras, which later helped reconstruct a timeline of events. In one of the diaries, the last entry read, On January 31st, we reached high ground and prepared for the climb. Near the tent, they found numerous footprints of at least eight pairs of bare feet heading towards a forest visible in the distance. Following them, the rescue team encountered something so terrifying it would stay with them for the rest of their lives. On February 27, 1959, the first two bodies were found about 1.7 kilometers from the camp, under a large cedar at the forest edge. They were Yuri Kravoniskenko and Yuri Doroshenko. Surprisingly, near them were the remains of a fire that had burned tree branches up to a height of 5 meters. Next to the fire, Doroshenko's body was buried in the snow with a burned hand. Near him, Kravoniskenko, with his right foot bare and a torn sock on the left, had torn skin on his hands and fingers and deep lacerations on his right shin. Rescuers noted that, judging by the tree's condition, the boys had tried to climb, literally tearing their skin on them. Doroshenko had wool socks on his feet and thinner ones over them. His face, ears, and nose lacked soft tissue, and his eye sockets were empty, as was his tongue, which had been ripped out. Additionally, considering the minus 30 degree temperatures, it was disturbing that they were in their underwear. That same day, about 300 meters from the fire and towards the tent, Igor Dyatlov was found face up, with an unbuttoned jacket, a bluish face, a short-sleeved vest belonging to Kravoniskenko, ski pants, and only socks on his feet. His watch had stopped at 3.31. He had many scratches on his right forearm and palm, along with multiple bruises and traumas on his right hand and knuckles, possibly indicating a fight. The fourth body found was Zinaida Kalmagorova, about 600 meters from the fire and face down. Her face and hands were purple. She wore two hats, a long-sleeved shirt, a plaid shirt, and another wool sweater with a torn cuff on her right hand. The next day, February 28th, Rustam Slobodin's body was found about 400 meters from the fire and towards the tent. He wore a long-sleeved shirt, sweater, two pants, and four pairs of socks. His watch had stopped at 8.45. This was the last body found in this expedition. Although the search continued for two more months, they did not find the remaining hikers. In early May, with the first thaws, 
A Monsi tribe member walking with his dog in the area found a series of cut branches 150 meters from the fire remains, leading him to a 4-meter deep ravine. There, he discovered a shelter made by the hikers to protect themselves from the freezing wind. On May 5, 1959, the remaining bodies were found. They were relatively close and had been buried by heavy snowfall, hidden from the initial rescue team's eyes. The first body to appear was Ludmilla Dubinina, kneeling with her face and chest against rocks. She wore a short-sleeved shirt, another long-sleeved shirt, two sweaters, one belonging to Kravana Skinko, socks, and two pairs of pants, with the outer pants torn and a small wool hat. Rescuers were horrified to see she had no eyeballs, upper lip, or tongue. Next to her, Semyon Zolotaryov, the guide, had similar injuries missing eyes and soft tissues around his mouth and eyebrows. Alexander Kolevidov's body also lacked soft tissue around the eyes, had a deformed neck and orange-toned skin. Lastly, Nikolai Thabobrignol's body had multiple skull fractures. This concluded the search for the hikers, but opened up multiple assumptions and speculations about what happened that day. The autopsies revealed shocking details. Igor Dyatlov died of hypothermia, with abrasions on his face and arms, and wounds on his hands, possibly caused by attempting to climb a tree. His bladder contained a liter of urine, nearly three times the normal capacity. Yuri Doroshenko also died of hypothermia, with burns on his head, ear, and foot, injuries on his hands, and bleeding in his mouth, possibly from falls or struggles. Ludmilla Dubinina suffered severe internal injuries with multiple rib fractures, the absence of her tongue, eyes, and lips, and injuries to soft tissues. Additionally, she had a broken and crushed nasal cartilage and a red mass of about 100 grams of coagulated blood in her stomach, suggesting she might have swallowed her own blood when her tongue was cut out while alive. Nikolai Thabobrignol died from severe head trauma with a fractured skull and internal injuries without signs of struggle or external wounds. Alexander Kolevitov died of hypothermia and internal injuries, with rib fractures, head wounds, and the absence of soft tissues on his face. Rustam Slobodin died of hypothermia with a skull fracture and minor injuries on his face and limbs, along with bruises on his knuckles. Yuri Kravaniskenko died of hypothermia, with burns on his leg and foot, hand injuries, and a missing nose tip. Part of the skin from his right hand was found inside his mouth. He also had a large amount of urine in his bladder. Zinaida Kalmagorova died of hypothermia, with head and hand injuries, and bleeding in soft tissues, indicative of falls or struggles. Finally, Semyon Zolotaryov suffered severe internal injuries with rib fractures, the absence of eyes, and soft tissue injuries. The autopsy showed that the undigested contents of their stomachs suggested the group had dinner around 6 or 7 p.m., and the event that ended their lives occurred between 9 p.m. and 12.30 p.m. the following day. The bodies exhibited gray hair coloration and orange skin tones, which, after several studies, revealed high doses of radiation. This led to the hikers being exhumed after funerals and burials to place them in lead coffins and bury them in a secret location. Various theories attempt to explain what happened. The avalanche theory suggests that an avalanche forced the group to abandon their tent at night, but there is insufficient evidence of an avalanche in the area. Another theory proposes disorientation and extreme weather conditions, such as catabatic winds and extremely low temperatures, which could have caused panic. The hypothesis of an attack by Monsi indigenous people has been dismissed due to the lack of signs of a struggle. Others suggest unusual natural phenomena, such as ice bombs. It is also speculated that the group might have witnessed secret military tests, such as missile launches, and were silenced by Soviet authorities. There are also supernatural theories, such as UFOs or the presence of a Yeti.
The official Soviet-era investigation concluded that an irresistible natural force had caused the deaths. However, the lack of conclusive evidence and the authorities' reluctance to provide additional information kept the mystery unsolved. The hikers' diaries and cameras provided valuable information about the days leading up to the incident, although they do not fully explain what happened on the night of their deaths. The photos show a well-organized camp without signs of panic. Yuri Yudin was the only member of the Dyatlov group who survived, thanks to a back injury that forced him to return home on January 28, 1959. This fortuitous circumstance saved his life, but also left him with a heavy emotional burden that he carried until the end of his days. Yudin never forgot his expedition companions and dedicated much of his life to seeking answers about what really happened at Dyatlov Pass. After the tragic discovery of his friend's bodies, Yudin became an unwavering advocate for the truth. He was convinced that the official conclusions about the irresistible natural force that caused the deaths were neither satisfactory nor complete. Over the years, Yudin actively participated in interviews, conferences, and meetings, always pushing for a deeper and more thorough investigation. He faced Soviet and later Russian bureaucracy, searching for classified documents and testimonies that could shed light on the mystery. His determination and commitment to his friend's memory led him to collaborate with independent researchers and support theories that went beyond the official explanations. However, he was never able to find a definitive answer that explained the strange and tragic circumstances of his companions' deaths. Despite the time and distance, Yuri Yudin kept the memories of his friends alive and continued his search for the truth until his death. He passed away on April 27, 2013, at the age of 75, without having discovered all the secrets of Dyatlov Pass. His death marked the end of an era in which a direct witness of the Dyatlov group fought for justice and truth. However, his legacy persists in the ongoing search for answers by researchers, enthusiasts, and those interested in one of modern history's greatest mysteries. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue exploring more mysteries and enigmas, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and give this video a like.